Few consider North Korea as being a rich state. However, if that's the case, why is this guy, Kim Jong-un, the North Korean dictator, smiling? Contrary to what people may think, the state is wealthy in a single regard. Friendship. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's minerals. Currently, North Korea is alarming the United States with its attempts to field long-range nuclear missiles, which could hit American cities. Nobody is aware of what's occurring inside the country. There can be an imminent sixth nuclear test tomorrow, or in a month, or never. An attack on the US or its allies could be suicidal. So what might be occurring is that Pyongyang likely aims to extract aid from the international community in exchange for dismantling a number of its weaponry. Rewind approximately 10 years to see the last time it pulled off the good old nuclear blackmail trick. But however much North Korea could extract from different nations in this way, the end result would pale in comparison to the price of its large, untapped underground resources. Below the nation's mostly mountainous surface are vast and rich mineral reserves. You're looking at a rock. 2.24 in the morning. This is not a rock. This is a mineral for the like 10th time. Okay. Got it. Which include more than 200 types of minerals. There are also massive quantities of uncommon earth metals, which factories in close by countries want in order to make smartphones and different high-tech products. It's predicted that the belligerent state sits on petroleum reserves which might be worth 6 to 10 trillion US dollars, according to the South Korean state-owned mining enterprise Korea Resources. Obviously, since this nation prefers to keep its own secrets to itself, there are no official reports on the scope of North Korea's mineral wealth. It's believed that North Korea has made some exaggerated claims about their mineral resources. We can see this for example in this article by Business Korea. The mining sector has been fundamental for North Korea since the 1970s. It has exceeded other industries in importance because of its irreplaceable role in providing enough materials and energy sources for the DPRK. That's the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea, in case you didn't know. For successful development of the mining industry, the DPRK has established three major and fundamental policies. 1. Strengthening geological exploration to promote new coal and mineral mines. Two. Promoting technological development in the excavation of underground tunnels and in ore collection procedures. And finally, scientific research in digging equipment and exploration. But while mining production increased until about 1990, iron and other mineral productions peaked in 1985. In 2012, the mines were counted, and North Korea has about 700 of them, according to the International Minerals Statistics and Information Report by the United States Geological Survey. Many, though, have been poorly run and are in a state of neglect. The nation lacks the equipment, expertise, and even basic infrastructure to properly tap into the jackpot that waits in the ground. In April, Lloyd R. Vasey, a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies said, quote, North Korean mining production has decreased significantly since the early 1990s. It is likely that the average operational rate of existing mine facilities is below 30% of capacity. There is a shortage of mining equipment, and North Korea is unable to purchase new equipment due to its dire economic situation, the energy shortage, and the age and generally poor condition of the power grid." End quote. It doesn't help that private mining is illegal in communist countries like North Korea. Just like private enterprise in general, it doesn't help either that the ruling regime, now led by Kim Jong-un, has been known to kick out foreign mining companies it's allowed in, or suddenly change the terms of agreements. You have Contract. You know, contracts are like hearts. They're made to be broken. Despite all this, the nation is so blessed with underground resources that mining makes up roughly 14% of its economy. The slump in coal prices in particular hurt Kim Jong-un's Bayanjin policy. His stated desire to simultaneously develop North Korea's economy and its nuclear weapons program. South Korea's government-run Korea Development Institute has said mineral trades between North Korea and China remain a cash cow for Pyongyang despite tough sanctions. 
Trade flows of mineral resources accounted for 53.6% of the North's total trade volume to China in the first half of 2016, KDI reported, based on statistics from the Korea International Trade Association. North Korea has been particularly active in coal mining in recent years because it's particularly important to the economic health of the country. In 2015, China imported about $1 billion worth of coal from North Korea. Coal is especially appealing because it can be mined with relatively simple equipment. Coal is also bartered for essentials, including oil, food, and machinery. Large deposits of the stuff are located near major ports and the border with China, making the nation's bad transportation infrastructure less of an issue. Beijing fears strengthening sanctions for importing coal could lead to the collapse of North Korea, sending a flood of refugees across the relatively porous border into China. And it also believes the United States and its ally South Korea share responsibility for growing tension in the region. Indeed, coal shipments to China, which were almost unnoticeable up to the year 2000, currently make up about 40% of all North Korea's exports, as reconstructed through the statistics of North Korea's trade partners. The actual share may be a little lower, since not all North Korean trade deals are counted. Because prices have been falling on international markets, the share of exports also began to slide in recent years. But it still remains pretty high. After North Korea conducted its first nuclear test in 2006, the UN began imposing ever stronger sanctions against it. In 2016, the nation's underground resources became a focus. The United Nations has blacklisted 39 North Korean individuals and 42 entities, which are subject to a travel ban and asset freeze. UN member states are obligated to enforce the sanctions, which are far-reaching and comprehensive. However, many include gray areas and exceptions, which are subject to interpretation. North Korea is under a total UN arms embargo. The sale of all arms and related material is banned. Any financial transactions related to the procurement of North Korean arms are also included under the sanctions. Coal exports are allowed up to a maximum of $400.87 million or 7,500,000 metric tons a year, whichever is lower, provided UN member states do not purchase the coal from a sanctioned entity and can prove that the coal is for livelihood purposes. China, North Korea's biggest trade partner, said in February 2017 it would suspend all imports of coal from North Korea for the rest of the year as part of its efforts to implement the sanctions, but come on, we all know that never happened. Sales of North Korean copper, nickel, silver, and zinc are completely banned under UN sanctions. Any financial services that contribute to North Korea's banned missile and nuclear program or help Pyongyang evade sanctions are also banned by the United Nations. Member states are prohibited from opening branches, subsidiaries, or offices of North Korean banks. Joint ventures, ownership, or correspondent banking relationships with North Korean banks is also banned. Of course, Pyongyang has grown adept at evading these sanctions, especially through shipping. Glimpses of its covert activities come from occasional interceptions of vessels. In August 2016, Egyptian authorities boarded a ship laden with 2,300 tons of iron ore headed from North Korea to the Suez Canal. They also found 30,000 rocket-propelled grenades below the ore. The seizures from the Jiaxun were the largest of ammunition in the history of sanctions against North Korea, the experts said, and showed the country's use of concealment techniques as well as emerging nexus between entities trading in arms and minerals. The panel said it also inspected an air shipment that originated in China and was destined for a company in Eritrea. It said the consignment of 45 boxes contained military radio communications products and related accessories, manufactured in North Korea that violated the arms embargo against the country. In the financial sector, the panel said it identified multiple ways in which North Korean financial institutions access the international financial system to evade sanctions. These include having North Korean banks hold accounts with foreign banks, form joint ventures with foreign companies, and maintain representative offices abroad. They also get foreign companies to establish banks in the North and use the North's trading companies to open bank accounts. North Korea's neighbors have long had their eyes on its bonanza of mineral wealth. About five years ago, China spent some $10 billion on an infrastructure project near the border with North Korea, primarily to give it easier access to the mineral resources. Conveniently, North Korea's largest iron ore deposits in Musan County are right by the border. An analysis of satellite images by 38 North, a website affiliated with John Hopkins University, showed mining activity was alive and well in the area.
Meanwhile, Russia, which also shares a smaller border with North Korea, in 2014 developed plans to overhaul North Korea's rail network in exchange for access to the country's mineral resources. That particular plan lost steam, but the general sentiment is still alive. In the video description, we've linked to this super interesting research paper that explores deep Russia-North Korea economic relationships. Hey y'all, I really hope you enjoyed the video. We'll keep making these mini documentaries every single week. All we ask in return is that you press that beautiful subscribe button and leave a comment because it would really help with the YouTube algorithm. Thanks.